Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship here in the First Presbyterian Church of Chester on this March 21st, 2020. Uh, I didn't get to say the one part. 2020, 21. Um, yesterday we celebrated the life of Carol Raver, even though she had passed a year ago or so. And it was a, a joyous celebration that we had. And uh, I must confess, I wore a suit that day, yesterday. Uh, the only thing I was, I couldn't button the front button as well. So. But now I'm back to my regular uh, worship clothes. <laughs> but uh, let's just do a few announcements for uh, this coming week. Uh, Monday there will be a Bible study at 10 a.m. The uh, food pantry truck uh, pickup uh, or the food bank is, is for uh, the afternoon. We'll be back here at church probably 3 p.m. or a little bit before. Wednesday there is uh, soup preparation and at 10 in the morning and crafters at 7 in the evening. Um, Thursday there will be I guess some activity with the soup and uh, Sunday, next Sunday is the one great hour share. You might have seen these envelopes as well as the inserts um, in, in your program. Um, there's a uh, soup sign up in the back, on the back table. Um, uh, also, uh, we'll be looking at the uh, Needing help for the ZD takeout dinner. And uh, next Sunday, there will be uh, brief worship, uh, sorry, brief meeting after worship, discuss planning of congregation conversations about the future of the, uh, our congregational pastoral leadership. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, note in there about uh, someone, if they're willing to be a uh, clerk of session. Are there other announcements or clarifications? <laughs> Hearing none, then let us turn to the worship this morning as we listen to the intro. Lord Jesus, you shall be my song. Just as I am, 
without one plea. taking the twelve, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets 
will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the right roadside begging. And hearing a multitude going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is passing by. And he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you have to do for, what do you want me to do for you? And he, he said, Lord, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And continuing, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Here ends the reading of our morning scripture. Overall, the 
us this confusing prediction of the Son of Man. That he'll be handed over to the Gentiles, mocked, insulted, spat on, flogged, and killed, but on the third day will rise again. I remember at the time I had no idea what he was talking about. What was he even saying? The Son of Man? Killed? No, it couldn't be. It was so far out of our ability to comprehend. Certainly it wasn't until our eyes were open on the, way, on the road to Emmaus that we began to understand it all. But right there and then in that moment, we were so completely blind to what lay ahead. We had no idea that it wasn't just a prediction, but in a sense a mission statement, an announcement. This is what the Son of Man has come to do. Service and sacrifice. It's not about triumphalism. It's Jesus' mission all along to seek out and save the lost. Service and sacrifice. Perhaps the irony is that just after Jesus tries to get this message through our dense, thick heads, and we miss it, we run into a blind man upon entering Jericho. This wasn't I mean, this was pretty typical. The blind, the lame, the lepers, those that were deemed as outcasts in society hung around the city gates, both for reasons of not always being welcomed into the city, but also to beg in hopes that a passerby would have pity and mercy on them. I remember hearing some yelling as we approached and wasn't sure what was going on. All I could hear was the crowds in front kept trying to tell someone to quiet down, to shut up already. Only it seemed to distress this person out more and more as he just got louder and louder and louder until Jesus saw him. He asked the crowds to bring the man over to him. To me, this echoed the parable where Jesus talked about the man having a banquet, telling his servant to go out to the streets bring in the blind, the lepers, the lame, the crippled. Here the blind is brought by the crowds into Jesus. Jesus asks him what he wants. The blind man says, I wish to see. And he calls him the son of David. I don't know about the crowds, but this was shock to my ears. Never before had anyone referenced Jesus as the son of David. And here was this blind man. How did he even know? He couldn't even see Jesus. And he was so confident in this statement, as well as his defiance to the crowds to be heard. Immediately Jesus replied, Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Before the rest of us could even blink our eyes and get caught up on what just happened, the blind man's sight was regained, and he began praising and glorifying God so much so that the crowds who wanted him to shut up joined in with the praising, forgetting how they had just a moment ago tried to hinder this from happening. This one that they were so quick to dismiss, to judge as not worthy, to hush and keep quiet, telling him not to bother Jesus, thinking that they knew what was best. I'd say they learned their lesson, but it was clear as we journeyed along their judgments for, for and against others had not changed, even, in their, even if their praises of and for this blind man. For you see, as we continued passing through Jericho and the crowds grew larger and larger, Jesus made a beeline to a certain sycamore tree. He saw someone up there and noted, we have to go see who that person is. Of course, Jesus already knew who it was. Calling him down from the tree by name and inviting himself to dinner. How did Jesus know this guy? I mean, who was he? I don't ever remember seeing him before in my life. Had he, he been a part of the crowd previous in our journey? Was he a long-lost friend of Jesus? I mean, how did Jesus know his name? But perhaps what's even 
even more surprising than knowing his name was that Jesus, better than the crowds, all those who seemed to know both his name and his occupation, Jesus knew this man's heart. And here, yet again, the crowds grumbled, again, with all their judgments. They blocked Zacchaeus from initially seeing Jesus, but they couldn't block Jesus from seeing him. And see him he did, more so than any of us. For you see, this man, this Zacchaeus, was a tax collector, a rich man, not just any tax collector, a chief tax collector. A Jewish businessman who was contracted by Roman officials to collect prescribed taxes, tolls, tariffs, and custom fees. Chief tax collectors were required to pay the contract in advance, and then they could hire others to collect the taxes in hopes that the amount that was brought in yielded a profit. This system was open and stymied with abuse. So many Jews viewed tax collectors, especially chief tax collectors, as traitors, a part of the Roman oppressor. So many in this crowd viewed Zacchaeus as a traitor, a dishonest Jew, taking advantage of his brothers and sisters and siblings while working for the oppression of Rome. So this is why the crowds grumble. Jesus is inviting himself to the house of this sinner. Inviting oneself, especially someone like Jesus, who had swarms of crowds following him, was a special honor. And I have to admit, even myself was taken back by all this when I heard the grumbles of the crowds. Once I realized who this man was, what he had done, he was a tax collector, a chief tax collector. Jesus is going to have dinner there? Why? Why would he invite himself to Zacchaeus' house if he knew all of this? I mean, Jesus had just told the story of the rich man and Lazarus not long before this. It was still on my mind how the rich man could treat his brother so poorly. It was so deeply lodged in my mind because we then ran into a rich young ruler a few days later who asked Jesus, what do we need to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him to sell everything he had, give it to the poor, and come and follow him. But the rich young ruler turned away sad instead. Jesus told us it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This was all still so fresh for me. I'm assuming for all the disciples and much of the crowds. But again, Jesus could see something that we couldn't. There was more than we understood going on. Zacchaeus was so overcome with joy, coming down from the tree by this invitation to host Jesus, he couldn't help but proclaim how he gives half of his possessions to the poor, and if he has defrauded anyone, he pays them back four times as much. It's a bit shocking, actually. A tax collector? Giving money to the poor? Not defrauding? I stood there with my mouth wide open. What did he just say? This rich tax collector just so willingly gives half of his possessions to the poor. Makes a point to not defraud anyone. It was clear no one knew how to respond. We all just froze in amazement of the statement, not what anyone was expecting. All of our preconceived notions, our judgments, they were all wrong. This was emphasized even more by Jesus' proclamation. Today, salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus, too, is the son of Abraham. Did you hear it? The son of Abraham. One who sees his brother, his siblings, cares for them, the poor, the neighbor, the stranger. One who uses his own blessings to be a blessing to others. Zacchaeus goes through the eye of 
the needles in ways that we thought were impossible. And here, before we even get to the other side of Jericho, these two men, these two outcasts, are redeemed back into society. As Jesus rightly proclaims, the Son of Man has come to seek out and save the lost. Like the lost lion, the lost sheep, the lost son. The blind man and the tax collector were lost. They were lost from society. Pushed out, pushed aside, marginalized, judged as unworthy, as dishonest, or as a sinner, as the other. But it's so often the case, Jesus sees what we don't. What we don't want to see, what we refuse to see, what we pretend not to see. There is more to someone than meets the eye, more to them than we know. While we are so tempted to write someone off so easily, Jesus refuses. Service and sacrifice, seeking out and saving. So it made me think, what would happen if we tried to see the crowds? those around us as Jesus sees them. Who might catch our attention? Who would we listen to in their cries rather than telling them to quiet down? What words of oppression might we be able to hear if we saw people as Jesus sees them? Who might we befriend and work towards justice with if we take the time to get to know them rather than judging them as someone who must be against justice. It's these questions that help me to continue on the journey, even after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Knowing this work now fell upon us, the disciples. It's how our eyes continue to be open to those we previously would have viewed as outsiders, unwelcome, unwanted. The Ethiopian eunuch baptized on the side of the road rather than ignored and left out, preaching to all Samaria, her enemies as Jews, accepting Paul's conversion even after his persecution of us early believers, the conversion of Cornelius and the welcoming in of all the Gentiles, no longer viewed as unclean. Jesus didn't just teach about welcoming, about seeing, about saving. He showed us exactly how to do it. He modeled it in ways that had lasting impacts with grace and love as he sought out and saved the lost. And this, this is what even you are continuing to do, to seek out and save. See those in the crowds that are deemed as lost. See those who are overlooked, unloved, lonely, hopeless, marginalized, or oppressed. Make a way for all to be welcomed into the saving grace of the love of God. Amen. Join me in our affirmation of faith that I'm printed in the bulletin. This morning it is adapt, adapted from Romans 8. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose.
lift up the prayers that remain on our hearts. into a time of offering a prayer of dedication. Lord, like a blind beggar, we fall before you amazed at your mercy and grace and rise to stand praising and glorifying God. May we, like the blind man, continue to follow after you, offering up praise. And like Zacchaeus, may we offer up tithes and offerings that mark our faith and commitment and service to you. Merciful Lord, thank you for sustaining us and others over the world. And your life is the size of the road, honor and success. And your church on the front of our ears is just a secret. Thank you for your mercy, not just as God of us, but on our whole world. And he says, God of us, give us all of our ears, our very lives, we refuse to spread all our sins. Oh, oh, oh. 
for this morning. Will you come and follow me?